I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Thomas Banks, an author, filmmaker, and tech industry veteran with over four decades of experience. Thomas' experience includes executive management experience at firms including Santiago Data Systems, GuideSmart, and Aperture Health, all of which he founded, along with Millennium Health Insurance, Splashplay, and more. Thomas has a degree in experimental psychology from California State University in Los Angeles and is the author of Indefensible, a prescient warning about the unintended consequences of rapid technological innovation, which we'll be discussing today. So Thomas, welcome, sir. It is truly a pleasure to have you with me today. Well, the honor is all mine, Tim, but you certainly made me sound pretty darn old in your introduction. <laughs> well, it, you know, it catches up with all of us, right? I mean, that's... We're, we're all moving through time, so. Well, as, as my major advisor said to me in college, he goes, you know, Tom, you're a genius. And I said, okay, but being a genius when you're young is exceptional, but when you get old, it's expected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm adequately genius to, uh, to have a good conversation with you. Well, so one of those moments of genius came through in your book, Indefensible, and this caught my eye for two reasons. Uh, first, it examines the rapid development of drone and quadcopter technology, and it highlights some of the really large defense and security concerns that are associated with it. And second, because you published this book in 2015, which puts you way ahead of the curve in recognizing the dangers here. So what was your inspiration in writing this back when you did? Well, it's, it's consistent with who I am and what I do as a technology person. Uh, I was actually sitting on a patio in, at a Panera one evening with a friend of mine smoking cigars, probably the best Panera in the country, you could smoke cigars on the patio, and a drone flew overhead and he goes, hey, what's that? I said, well, it's a drone. And he thought, well, that's kind of neat. And I said, yeah. And all of a sudden I said, but, and the entire idea for Indefensible materialized at that moment, that it looks good, it's interesting, but, you're, but think of all the unexpected consequences, having these autonomous devices that can navigate by themselves. You don't need to be smart to operate them and they have weight carrying capacity. My goodness. And when you see things like light shows using drones, et cetera, all of it starts to come together as these represent not just an incredibly exciting technology, but an unbelievable threat. And, yeah. and a threat that I believe is indefensible because they are small, they're evasive, they can fly below the radar, they can come from any direction, and you're not going to shoot them down with an F-18 because they're, they're traveling at 30 miles an hour, 50 feet off the ground. So hence the indefensible proposition. And uh, the apparently, you know, your observation that I was... I was kind of foreshadowing this back in 2015 it is interesting because when you publish on Amazon, you kind of know where your books are sold. And I swear to you, one of the first copy, copies of Indefensible that was purchased was in Washington, D.C. Okay, there you go. So well, I'm guessing the CIA or somebody bought a copy. <laughs> As as well they should. You touched on a lot of really big issues, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you with me. You know, a lot of those we're starting to see emerge now, and I think some of the others we may start to see emerge. But the book itself, you pointed out that hobbyists, realtors, search and rescue teams, law enforcement teams, even retailers like Amazon are using a wide collection of drones as low cost, easy to deploy tools for remote surveillance and delivery. So if Correct. the price performance and ease of use put this tech within the reach of the general public in this way, then it also makes it available for criminal activities and terrorists, right? It certainly does. The it's, It democratizes uh, terror that anyone can have access to it, whether someone's trying to sneak a cell phone into a prison for their boyfriend or a drug cartel wants to move fentanyl across the border unseen. The, it, the technology is so darn capable, it's, it makes it available to everyone. 
I'm a pilot. I have thousands of hours of, of flying all over the country. And it, uh, it scares the bejesus out of me to think that there's a 10 pound piece of equipment flying around at 30 miles an hour and is going to hit me or I hit it because we're afraid of hitting seagulls yeah. when we're flying into airports. So think about drones. When indefensible opens up, it opens up to a terror event where an airliner is destroyed because of a bomb laden drone explodes in its pathway. And we all think of bombs as the ultimate threat, a bomb with some nails and ball bearings and, you know, the, the brothers, uh, Taramazov, I think it was their name in Boston, the, uh, the Boston bombers. But, you know, that's not what's scary. What's scary is the insidious ability to deliver things more than just an explosive, like poison. And in the, in the book, we focus on the delivery of ricin. And yeah. in your introduction, you mentioned a drone can carry a pound or six pounds of material. One pound of ricin, which can be fabricated in your backyard from a caster plant with, with high school chemistry skill, will kill a quarter of a million people. Yeah. Boom. A quarter of a million people will, can die from a pound of ricin. Now imagine... 30 drones, each carrying a pound of rice and going into downtown New York or L.A. or, you know, Montreal. Pick a place. It, it's, it's actually quite frightening. Yeah, well, let me let me back up just a second. Again, these are some of the reasons that sure. I thought it was absolutely critical to do the interview with you and, and why I'm so excited to have you with me, because really what you're getting into is this asymmetrical warfare capability that drones open up. Right. And, and yes. that's something like we're seeing that in Ukraine right now. So a few years back, you know, if you had told people, I mean, you know, go back to like 2005, 2010, if you'd said, well, you got to worry about extremists strapping bombs to quadcopters, they would have said, you know what, that's alarmist. You know, we're not that, it that's, is. The, you know, that's, that's science fiction that, that could happen, but will it? No. Okay. So the Ukraine war changed that. Now we routinely see drones of every size and shape used for battlefield surveillance and as loitering munitions they can carry up to a six pound explosive payload so I, what are your thoughts on seeing at least the initial predictions in this book come to pass i think it's inevitable uh people didn't kill each other with guns until guns were invented so every time humanity creates a new weapon people will use it and that's the scary part we did use the atomic bomb and so it is a it is a frightening thought and the more desperate people become the more likely they're going to turn to these technologies the the asymmetric nature of warfare is important but it's really about cost of entry yeah. one reaper drone will cost you you know 22 million dollars or something like that but for a million dollars you could deploy 100,000 micro drones for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. And so the, the barrier to entry does not exist. Anybody can initiate an asymmetric battlefield advantage by going to Amazon and order 50 D DJ DJI drones. And that's it. You're, you're, you're in the, you're in the business. You can make them out of Legos. Drones can be made from anything. And so there is no barrier to entry. And as they become smarter and smarter and more and more autonomous, it even can take out the need for your involvement. In one of the scenes in Indefensible, the drones are brought to us by bad actors in North Korea, and they're delivered via you know, uh, shipping containers to a Walmart parking lot. But mm. deep in the morning, the top of the shipping container opens up and 100 drones rise up and fly across the border of Mexico to America to their waiting terrorists. Wow. <laughs> you don't even have to you know, go through the ports. There, there is no barrier to entry, either economically or strategically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're limited by battery life. You're limited by range. And 
control mechanisms, but even those will continue to improve over time, right? And we've seen massive improvements in that. Absolutely. There, the drones can be solar powered. There's no limit to what can keep the drone aloft. But the reality is, it's not a long range attack strategy. You're not going to fly from California to New York with it. You're going to fly from 50 miles away from Dodger Stadium. And 10 of you, 10 terrorists are each going to be at some point out 50 miles away. And there are 10 drones that are going to converge on Dodger Stadium, making it impossible to anticipate, respond to, and then they will release their havoc collectively upon arrival. And you'll never find them because they're sitting in a soccer mom minivan in Culver City somewhere, 50 miles away. So it they don't have to get up close and comfortable. They can do it from the privacy of their van and release it through the sunroof. Yeah. And this is and a massive, massive change. This is it, it, it in in terms of potential for damage. This is a, a massive change. So, you know, I'm using Ukraine as kind of my primary example, and drone attacks didn't start there. I, I forgot the name of it. There was another conflict before that, and I've been told that that is really where it started. But I think Ukraine is the one that most people are familiar with, right? And Be uh, Because it's it's so publicized, but it was yeah. going on in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, terror, uh, Afghanis were, were attaching grenades to them and, and dropping the grenade over a target. Uh, you know, kind of a sloppy method, but it was effective. But your point is that they are cheap, they are available, they can loiter, and they're they're just not noticeable. They're they're just indefensible, and and nobody uh, uh, the attacker isn't put at risk. He could be, he could he could have launched a drone and, and gone home and let it do it autonomously, and it would fly to its target. Thirty two minutes later, it explodes. Well, and that that is one of the future concerns, right? And again, I think that's why it's good to kind of get a handle on this now as the technology moves forward. So one of the things that we're seeing in Ukraine is the advent of jamming systems. And those, from what I understand, depending on the type of drone and the distance and a lot of other factors, those can be more or less effective. But one of the things, uh, Kalishnikov, the makers of the AK-47, just unveiled a new X-wing quadcopter, which reportedly is capable of autonomous flight, right? So mm -hmm. the very defenses that we are developing against these are forcing the evolution of workarounds for it. And that's pushing things towards autonomy, as you mentioned earlier. Right. We think of uh, jamming technology to interfere with the GPS transmissions, to spoof GPS, to interfere with radio for the radio control. Autonomous aircraft may not even use GPS. They could use inertial navigation. They could use mapping, optical mapping and, and recognition systems, which I describe in Indefensible, where if the drone is, 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 is spoofed from being able to communicate via GPS or whatever, it would just go to the to its optical technology and track itself via map. The one thing is these things don't need to get right there. They just need to get close. They're kind of like the horseshoes of weapons. So if they so so what they're a half a mile short, they're still gonna kill people. So we're not looking at precision guided missiles. And as I pointed out to somebody recently, if I were to jam a drone that was carrying six pounds of explosives or Ryzen or any other kind of you know, frightening material, and it, I, I was able to jam it and crash it to the ground, well, it's going to kill the people right there then. Somebody yeah. is going to die. It doesn't evaporate. And then they go, well, I'll do, we'll just use lasers. Well, to put a laser on a Humvee or a or an, or a military vehicle, you would have to have thousands upon thousands of these mechanisms situated all over the place at the cost of millions of dollars a piece to be able to create a, 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 a protective shield of laser beams. Well, nobody's going to do that because we have 50 states, untold numbers of cities, et cetera, you couldn't put enough of these devices anywhere to protect anybody. There's, therein lies the problem. So to think that we can create a, a barrier 
a technological barrier that would jam or in, interfere with their ability to perform is 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 a mistake. They it cannot be done. Now. Do you see any kind of a manufacturing barrier being put in place? Some of the other ideas that just came to mind were the chipsets for these, right, which are fairly standardized. Is there a way to put some kind of a limiter in there, right? So if you're broadcasting, a, you know, a message from public place, the drone will refuse to go in there or some kind of an auto shutdown override or something along those lines. I mean, at some level, you know, you're going to have to create one of these using off-the-shelf parts and components, right? And some of those are pretty specialized. Do you think that there's a way to mandate changes to some of those specialized components? Well, there already are mandates with respect to geofencing to keep drones out of airports and things like that. But that's only for people who are participating. So mm. if you have a bootleg drone, you could go get a $25 Pi computer that's about the size of a pack of cigarettes and a bunch of Legos and some motors, you can build a drone and then you give it its programming and you're off to the races and there are no limiting factors because that Pi computer is just a computer like your laptop's a computer. So there will there isn't any government injected control. Today with the use of drones and the new the new licensing requirements for drone operators, your drones have to have identifying numbers on them. Bad guys won't register their drones, nor will they use technology that has the geofencing. So if, if we have a bad actor like North Korea that decides to manufacture drones, you can rest assured they're not going to embed the geofencing yeah. logic into that drone because that defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. Well, and again, going back to the payload, and this is one of the things when when I read the, the book overview, this is one of the things that really grabbed me. So again, going to Ukraine, we're seeing this six pound explosive payload. We've seen an evolution of that as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was at first it was like you would see a drone way up above something and then you would see this little dart drop and then explode now we are seeing drones literally do kamikazes into tanks. Um, we're, we're also seeing drones land on very large aircraft, and they can cause enough damage to keep the aircraft from taking off, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, that is just using the explosive payload. But one of the things that you got into was for something like ricin, you can create a lot more havoc for that six pounds. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as I said, with a pound of rice and it, it'll kill a quarter of a million people. So six yeah. pounds of rice will kill over a million. Um, that's a pretty deadly proposition for something that is inexpensive to make. Even Walter Wright in Breaking Bad used a, a, a rice, a grain of rice size rice and to kill Lydia in the end, remember? And so it is a it is a very democratic attack strategy that anyone can use. They don't have to be from Silicon Valley. And that is what's frightening. And so when you see warriors from Ukraine to Afghanistan, to Yemen, to Africa, to India, Pakistan, it's happening everywhere. Airports are being pillaged by this technology. People are being threatened. And the more the more we accept it and we accept the entertainment value if you will where we allow amazon to deliver a box of crackers to my house or we get to go to a, a baseball stadium and watch a drone light show all of that does is creates more and more noise within which bad actors can operate so if you've got a million drones flying around doing nothing nefarious. They're just delivering your order from Amazon. Accompanying them could be bad actors that are delivering yeah. other things to other places. We have a tough enough time in aviation to keep the thousands of airliners and general aviation planes from crashing into each other. How do you deal with 10,000 randomly assigned drones operating in independently uh, with their only intent is to wreak havoc. That's a that's a very frightening proposition. 
Well, the other aspect that you just touched on was when you were talking about light shows, you're getting into drone swarms, right? Right. And so that is something where, again, from a science fiction perspective, I remember reading 20 years ago about nanotech swarms and the sure. danger of swarm attacks, right? These aren't nanotech. These are much larger. But at the same time, what we're seeing is I, I just saw something in China the other day where they had hundreds, potentially thousands of drones with lights on them working together to make an amazing moving display in the sky, you know? Right. And they were able to coordinate all of this using computers and, you know, glowing lights on the drones. I mean, it was incredible. But when you look at that from a potential attack perspective, that's also incredibly dangerous, right? Because it shows that swarm technology is already here. Oh yeah, the swarm technology is already here. Think of those those independent individual drones in a swarm as a pixel on your laptop display. Yeah, each one is a pixel, and they're being coordinated by a big d drone display controller, if you will, and the programming tells it what to do. Now they're not real accurate; they're within a, a foot or so of each other, but they're far enough away where it looks pretty. But you don't have to be very accurate if those. 500 drones decide to turn on the stadium and explode that's yeah. the scary part and how do you defend it one gentleman said well i'll just take a shotgun okay 50 drones are heading your way and you have a shotgun with five rounds of ammunition in it which of the 50 drones are you going to kill with your shotgun and even if you shoot it it's going to crash and dis disperse its contaminant there there's a bigger issue here and you know, we, we walk around in America and we're, we're pro-gun and we're pro-this, we're pro-that. We're pro-things that are given to us by the Constitution. It says, you have a right to. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say, I have a right to have a drone. Yeah. And therein lies the problem. That you, you ha we see what the consequences are with respect to weapons and ammunition because of our constitutional rights. But the complications associated with distributing a piece of technology without any consideration for its consequences, unintended consequences, is fundamentally flawed. I'm trying to remember the gentleman that the gentleman that invented the cell phone. The names escaped me. I wrote about them in an article. And if they had known that their cell phone would be the cause of 50,000 deaths a year from car accidents with people texting and talking on phones, they might not have invented the cell phone because of these unintended consequences. These guys have blood on their hands because they invented a really great technology that does a lot of good stuff, but thousands of people die every year. Yeah. Those are the unintended consequences. Well, I want to touch on Slaughterbots. I believe that was the name of it. It was an activist awareness video. It was right. not real, but it looked real enough to scare a lot of people. And it showed a micro drone carrying what appeared to be like a 22 caliber bullet, just a tiny little bullet. But in this case, rather than, you know, a six pound explosive, the single bullet, the drone basically flies up to a target's head using AI and using all the advanced technology that it had available and it does a strategic assassination, right? And again, right. a single drone like that in, in the Slaughterbots video, that itself was scary because this thing was fast. He releases it into the air, it flies out, and then a few seconds later, it comes out of nowhere and, and you know, and releases its payload, okay? Right. But it, it, I think Slaughterbots also had swarm potential associated with it. So, you know, not only are we talking about large drones or medium-sized drones like we're seeing in Ukraine, but we could also be seeing much smaller drones that are harder to detect as well, right? Well, yeah, imagine computers are very small when you think about it. When you get rid of the keyboards and all the other stuff, everything in there is pretty tiny. The, you, you, you hold a, a little memory stick today, which has a terabyte of storage on it, inconceivable 10 years ago. A, a micro drone that's the size of a, a dragonfly or a, or a cricket that's going to use AI and 
image recognition, facial recognition to find you, to identify you, and deploy the smallest of, of projectiles that's a, simply a shaped charge that hits you and explodes in your head. And it could seek you out. And they don't have to put one to go do it. They could deploy 10,000 to go find you. Yeah. And one of them will find you. If you, if somebody wants to kill a public official, apparently it can be done. It's been done. Presidents, leaders of countries have been assassinated. Imagine how would the Secret Service protect President Biden if 5,000 micro drones sporting these slaughter bot shaped charges using facial recognition decided their job was to find one person? Yeah. How do you defend against that? That's that is a real that is a real concern. And I think and again, that's why I'm so excited to be able to interview you, because, you know, I, I think that awareness needs to be raised about the destructive potential of this, you know. And so I, I don't want to badmouth drones at all. They do so much good in the world overall. There are so many amazing things that drones are doing today and are capable of doing in the future. I mean, again, like you'd mentioned search and rescue. Um, I had read about a, so I believe in Switzerland, they're developing a drone that can airlift 400 pounds down the side of a mountain. And so when they have people who get stuck or skiers who break legs and things like mm -hmm. that, in the past, they would have to try and get a helicopter up there. They might not be able to get the person at all, and they might have troubles evacuating them. Now, they can put them on a drone, send them down and get medical help, and they can do it very rapidly, right? So Correct. drones are already saving lives, and they have the potential to save many more. Well, they're perfect for delivering medicines and to out, you know, out in the outback of, of Australia or Africa or someplace, things that aren't reachable where they can't justify yeah. storing medicines everywhere. So you store them in centralized locations, you zip them to where they need to go with a drone, and you don't have to have pilots on board, no one's at risk of dying, the weather doesn't matter. If the drone crashes, send another one. It's that kind of thing. So there's a certain economy of scale that comes along with this, which offers great, great benefits. But we can't ignore the reality that unchecked, un, uncontrolled could lead to ex exploitation. And I'm not trying to you know, scare people, but it was so obvious to me that something needs to be done to ensure that these technologies are controllable, they're accountable, you, you can be defended against them, uh, bad actors can be identified quickly, acted upon, you know, raise the raise the 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 consequences. So it's just yeah. not slap somebody on the wrist. It's use a drone, go to jail. You know, whatever it is, there needs to be a government initiative that says, we better deal with this now versus two years from now when you know Shea Stadium is destroyed and that and 25,000 people die in one attack. And that's the magnitude we're talking about. We're not talking about 9-11 magnitude. We're talking about 10 and 20 and 50 times the magnitude. In such an asynchronous matter, it does, there's no way to react to it. Well, and so you'd mentioned, you know, the, the government. It, right now, the Department of Defense is working on what's called the Replicator Initiative, and there, which claims to seek to counter China's strength in numbers through the use of vast numbers of low cost attributable weapons, right? And so mm -hmm. essentially they're talking about drones. I don't recall if they specifically said drones in the announcement. I don't think they did. But from what I understand, it, that was kind of out there is that that was what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. So it appears that even the U.S. military is looking at leveraging you know, swarm technology, economies of scale, you know, the, the low cost. And, um, you know, I mean, all of these things that make drones, you know, so useful in some ways and so dangerous in others. Right. Do you think that the military's participation in this, getting into this, um, do you think that that will help us understand the potential dangers of it and get a better handle on those? 
Yeah, I think that the understanding is already there. The, the reality is when we look at the, 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 the theater of, 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 of challenges we have out there with respect to you know, you know, war fronts, it is so vast, so complicated, so asymmetric that you, you really can't approach it conventionally. It's either nuclear weapons or a million troops. But we don't have a million troops and we don't want to use nuclear weapons. So you're going to have to fall back to robotics, autonomous systems, inexpensive solutions, things that can be deployed cheaply and effectively. This is not going to happen uh, in a vacuum. The military, I am certain, already has their head wrapped around this. That's why we have uh, the, the, new, the, 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 the new fighter jets that are designed to operate not just with themselves, but with accompanying supersonic drones. So you have mm. one pilot, two drones, they're flying coordinated activities, and the, you're only putting one pilot at risk, but you have the firepower of three aircraft because they're networked together, just like, just like your, your, your computers are networked, so that it is all choreographed and organized, kind of in a mini swarm. Take that to the next level, and go to mega swarms, go to mega swarms of micro technology, and they become more like viruses that are being deployed toward the target. So whether it's a, a conventional quadcopter that weighs six pounds, or it's 10,000 micro choppers that are the size of a, you know, a, a, a butterfly, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It only has to have enough killing power to achieve its objective. And we need to think more about that. Uh, remember in the, in the movie uh, From the Earth to the Moon, I think it was, the TV series, when they were talking about the problem, what happened in, in Apollo 1 when it exploded. And they were having a Senate investigation. They said, you know, they were asking some astronaut, well, what do you think the problem is here, astronaut, sir? And he turned to the center and he said, it's a lack of imagination. We never thought it would happen. We didn't yeah. imagine it would happen. So I contend the issue is imagination. We need to imagine what the possibilities are. And from that imagining, we can start to fabricate a response. But in, no one believed or imagined airlines would crash into buildings on 9-11. Now we imagine that. But before that, you never thought about it. I never thought about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, but, and some of it also is, you know, I, so I just saw Dune Part 2, right? Mm -hmm. And and they had, I don't remember what the name of it was, but they had the little flying assassination robot in that. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, there was a sci-fi series that had that in it as well several years ago. And it's one of those things where it's it's scary, but you know, thank God it's science fiction. You know, thank God we don't have things like that in real life. So thank part God, of this right. imagination is realizing, hey, we have things like that in real life now, right? We do, and we've had them for a long time. You know, it's the we've have people have had weapons that the average person never thought about the powers of these weapons, the capabilities. You know, as Stephen Hawking famously said, and I quote him in my book, autonomous weapons will become the collision cause of tomorrow because they're cheap, they're reliable, they're accessible. And that's what makes a, a, a collision cause so wonderful as a weapon. They don't cost anything. They're stamped out of some metal and anybody can operate it and they, and they do their job. Well, the same is true with weaponized drone systems. Whether the drone has got, has got four wheels and is driving on the ground and, and gets under your car and blows up, or it's a swarm of drones, each carrying pounds of explosives, and they're heading toward Hoover Dam to blow it up or whatever. Data centers, you know, food processing facilities. Every target of value is easily accessible through this kind of technology. And that's the scary thing. Yeah. 
And that makes indefensible an absolute wake up call. I'm going to put links into the book in the show notes. I want people to read this, learn more about it. And I want to ask, um, well, I, I want to thank you for your time. And I want to My close pleasure. by asking, what is coming next? Do you have another book in the works? Are you thinking about a successor to this as technology moves forward? Or do you have another area of concern that you want to write about? Well, Indefensible 2 AI is in the works and will be ready by summer. And you can imagine where that's going. And uh, that's going to be my focus for a while. I want to, I want to, I want to make sure this message is heard. I never expected Indefensible to be that interesting to a lot of people. I hear from people from all over the world. I have reviews from India. I hear from people from India and Great Britain and Japan. And I'm going, wow, being an author is kind of a neat thing. And I, had, I was never an author before I wrote Indefensible. And what's important is the message is resonating. Yeah. Our job, Tim, is to make sure that more and more people hear the message. It's not about me selling books. It's about the message. It's about call your congressmen, call your senators, call anybody to say, hey, wait a minute. We need to wake up to this. And I don't hear anybody doing anything about it. When was the last Senate hearing you heard about the threat of autonomous weaponized drones in America? We haven't. But yeah. the moment they moment it happens, all those guys will be banging their fists saying, we should have been dealing with this. We should deal with it now. There are answers. There are technological solutions. There are, there are administrative solutions. There's, there's, it's like TikTok. Tick, you might like TikTok, you might hate TikTok, but in some countries, TikTok is illegal and it can be banned. If it's causing a problem, it can be banned. Our own government bans TikTok on government computers. So it can be blocked. The same can be done, but we may have to go to the nexus. Where are these coming from? Who's the technology leaders? You just don't have the right to build this technology unless we know that what you're building, we can control, we can protect our citizens, et cetera. Right now, anybody with an engineering degree can make a drone and off they go. Thomas, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure and thank you for the, inviting me on and God bless you and your readers. And uh, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you. <laughs>